This message is produced by TruthFromGod.com, which is one of hundreds of messages that can be read, heard, and watched at TruthFromGod.com. Good words gone bad. The word game played today is taking something that was good and so perverting it that its whole meaning is changed into something bad. An example of this is the word gay, which a few years ago was defined as having or showing a merry, lively mood, bright or showy, and its synonyms were cheerful, gleeful, happy, joyous, vivacious, sparkling. But today its meaning has been so twisted that it denotes homosexuality. What could be further from its origin in the 13th century? For the last 700 years, homosexuality was seen as an abomination and not as an alternate lifestyle or sexual preference. Until after his death, Rock Hudson was not known to be gay or he would never have had a movie career. During his stardom, there was still a vast majority of people that held the biblical teaching that homos were an evil perversion. Now look at Christianism's teaching during the last few decades. Gays are welcome into all congregations with open arms. They keep chanting the slogan, we don't hate the sinner, just the sin. God is a God of love, so don't be judging. In Leviticus 20.13 and 18.29, Yahweh God says to kill them all, put the evil out from among you. The repercussions of this word twisting are endless. Imagine, in the next few decades, a child reading a historical document that says Benjamin Franklin went to many gay parties while in France. Now, in the child's mind, Benjamin Franklin is a faggot, and so history is rewritten. Good words are corrupted into bad ones with a purpose. Yes, there is a conspiracy of evil doing this. There is a race of devils that are always twisting truth into lies. Jesus, Yahweh identifies them in John 8, 31 through 59 as the Jews. No. They are not evil because they do not believe something or accept him. They'll never do anything but murder and lie because the devil is their racial father, as stated in John 8:44. The fundamental principles laid out in the Bible are you don't gather figs from thorns or grapes from bramble bushes. Tares do not become wheat or wheat tares. The prodigal son returned to the same father he left. And you shall know a tree by its fruit. The Bible is not teaching principles that pertain to growing plants. But these are illustrations about identifying types of people. This is a genetic thing, and the English word gene comes from the Greek word genia, which is translated generations in the King James Version of the Bible, and it is a racial word. Jesus uses genia. Matthew 23, 33, and 36, where he tells the Jews, Ye serpents, ye generation, genia, race of vipers. 
and that all the woes he enumerated in Matthew 23, 1 through 36, shall come upon this generation, genia, race. This bloody race continued their satanic seed activities against Jesus, Yahweh Shua, by calling him a Samaritan, bastard, mulatto, devil, in John 8, 48, by crucifying him all the while, crying, His blood be on us and on our children. Matthew 27, 25. The Jews always attempting to hide their true identity tried to change the scriptures with their Masoretic text but made very little headway until after infiltrating the universal Catholic Church during the Spanish Inquisition at the end of the 15th century. The Inquisition continued into the 16th century with the Jews converting to Christianity and establishing the Jesuit priesthood that has run the Catholic Church ever since. Within 12 years of the founding of the Jesuit Jew priesthood and in of their Pope Clement the Seventh, Martin Luther split from the church in 1546 AD. After the Jew Jesuits gained control, then the Catholic Bible was reprinted, and it was this new version that the King James Version used extensively. During the last 600 years, the racial children of the devil waged a never-ending campaign twisting the words of the scriptures and completely corrupting all of Christianity. They are the experts in the word game distortion and have turned the theological terms held sacred into the grotesque things they are today. Jews control all the media which disseminates their endless perverted propaganda through movies, radio, TV, magazines, newspaper, textbooks, and various versions of the Bible. Through the Jews' banking debt system, they own all individuals, corporations, and governments. America has the best government that Jew money can buy. If you do not understand the Jews' ownership of all banks, then find out who owns the Federal Reserve. No, it's not the federal government. This is also another of their word games. The Bible says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. Have you been blinded as to what is really going on in our land and throughout the world? Do you know who owns the banking cartels in every country? The World Bank? An International Monetary Fund, IMF? I'll give you a hint. They're Jews. As Romans 13, 12 says, Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Look at the good words gone bad. Some of these I have addressed in other messages. But the following are just a few making up the giant iceberg that's ripped a fatal wound into the bowels of white western man. Think about the term Israel, Christ, Christian, church, salvation, heaven, hell, 
God's law, his name, his family's name, and Jesus' name. All of these have either been hidden or their meanings changed. This word forging creates the hog slop that's killing the spirit of strength in our white western people, the Israel of the Bible. No muscle can survive on such a putrid diet. It's time to get on the meaty food of the Bible's truth. In the day of Jesus, there was no such thing as the New Testament. The whole foundation of his mission was based upon Old Testament prophecies. Do away with the Old Testament and you do away with his Messiahship. Isn't this what the Jews have been trying to do for thousands of years? And they have gotten Christians to proclaim far and wide that the Old Testament no longer applies and that they are New Testament believers. They even go as far as to say, our God is the God of the New Testament not that mean one in the Old Testament. How blind must one be not to see the fallacy of their statements of faith in repudiating the Old Testament? Not only do they destroy the hundreds of prophecies which identify Jesus, Yahweh as the Messiah, but also to whom he came. Jesus said in the New Testament, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15, 24. He told his disciples to only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10, 6. Perhaps what the Jews hate the most is when Jesus tells them, Ye are not of my sheep as I said unto you. John 10, 26. Yes, he had previously told them who they were and were not. In John 8, 31 through 59. The Jews were never Israel or God's chosen people. And yet Christians say that the Jews are God's chosen people Israel that even Jesus was a Jew. Riding on the coattails of this lie is the monster of all prevarication, and it is that all white people are the children of the devil. The Jews have taught the clergy very well the theological cemeteries to ignore plain statements of the scripture and adhere to the religious doctrinal decrees which these serpent seeds have continually injected into Christianity for over 600 years. Furthermore, these New Testament believers have not replaced and become the literal Israel of the Bible Read what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 9, 4 through 5 about the Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all God bless forever amen all this pertains to only one race of people and they are Israelites and not Jews nor any other non-Adamic race according to the Bible God has not done away with the race of his people called Israel and replaced them with an array of whatnots that claim to believe in Jesus. 
God is not adopting a mixed multitude of confessors who now become a New Testament spiritual Israel. Here is a simple question to ask these Christianites. Has God cast away the Adamic white racial people Israel? This question is asked in Romans 11, 1. And answered the very next verse, Romans 11, 2. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Now don't get confused. The Jews are not now or ever have been Israel, but are the racial children of the devil. Jesus emphatically states in John 8, 44. Go back and read Romans 9, 4 through 5 however many times are necessary to understand that it is Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption, not any other race. This point of fact is hateful to Christianism because they want the adoption to pertain to their followers, regardless of what race they are, since according to them, all non-Jews are children of the devil. And after a few magic words of faith, God will adopt them as his children. <laughs> yeah, sure. Evidently, their Bible is full of examples where God turns tares into wheat or thorns into figs. And where the prodigal son gets him another father, and never goes back home to the one he left. Now, do you understand why the Jews want to steal your identity? They separate you from the covenants, promises. Therefore, in blind ignorance, you are rendered powerless, for you can claim nothing as your own, except the fatherhood of Satan, your entire inheritance and birthright is ripped away from you, and you lay naked and helpless. What is said in Romans 9, 4 through 5 is never contradicted or given to anyone else. So if you believe the Jew lies, then go no further, throw away the Bible, for none of it pertains to you. Never enter another church and never join any denomination. Here again, these New Testament believers never see the fallacy of their own doctrine of faith. There is another crucial point raised in this passage of Romans. It is Israelites to whom was the giving of the law. And it does not pertain to anyone else. This is just like the laws of the United States do not pertain to any other country. Here again, we come to one of the main tenets of Christianism's heretical teachings, which is that the law of God's been done away with that all believers are under grace. They create this new theology by ripping a piece from Romans 6, 14, lift it out of context, and completely ignore what Paul says in the very next verse, or anything else said in the Bible. No, the law of God has not been done away with. Just pay attention to what Paul says in Romans 7, 25. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. What does this sound like to you? In order to get their congregation to do all that God forbids, church kikes claim the law, you know, the Old Testament stuff. Has no validity now. The question to put to them is, what is sin? 
the definition is given in the New Testament in 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth the law, for sin is transgression of the law. According to this, sin is violation of God's law. Now, if there is a no law, then there is no sin. And if there is no sin, then why would anyone need a savior from sin? No one can be judged or convicted for breaking a law that does not exist. Churchism, blinded by due perversion of all scripture, cannot see any of their fallacies. While saying the law's been done away with, they go around trying to sell everyone a savior from the penalties of that non-existing law. Church cocks also like to boast that they are serving God. And yet, the service of God pertains only to Israel. Hmm, how does that figure? since they say the Jews are Israel. It is just one more stone in their Babel Tower of illogical, irrational ideology. Of course, these clerics are doing all the things that God's law forbids. They're running around getting all races to join their congregations. They're continually going to non-white countries in order to get these whatnot people saved so they too can go to heaven. Nowhere in the scriptures is Israel ever commanded by God to go to other races and get them to become a part of their racial nation. The opposite is true. Israel was to drive out all the other races from the land, if any fought back, they were to kill them all. If this churchy organization were serving God, then there would not be a race problem in our nation because there would be only the Adamic white Israel Western people in it. The missionaries going out from here would go only to other white countries to help them drive out all the other races. There is no service of God being performed by Christianism. Jesus speaks about this contorted creature called Christianum. Matthew 7, 22 through 23, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Christianity has become so Jew perverted that it is nothing more than the tag for the workers of iniquity. The name itself is the antithesis of what it is supposed to represent. Don't be deceived by today's Christianity because part of the word is Christ. For this was not Jesus' last name either. Our English word Christ is a transliteration of the Greek word Christos. This Greek word has no implied divine meaning if you have been misguided into believing that Christ has something to do with being godly, then what do you do with Matthew 24, 24, Mark 13, 22, and Luke 21, 8? 
The definition of the Greek word Christos is the anointed and is a noun. Its root is from the verb Creo. Jesus was anointed Creo by God and thus became God's anointed Christos, the anointed. Acts 4.27 and 10.38 Those who have been enlightened by God to know the truth must stop using the Jew perverted transliterated word Christ and start using what the Greek word actually means so the Bible will come alive. Look at 2 Corinthians 1.21 now he which established us with you in the anointed and hath anointed us is God. And Colossians 1.27 says that the anointed in you is the hope of your glory. That same anointing that was done to Jesus is also done to us and it is this anointing abiding in us that assures us of our glorification for this is the very essence of our hope the apostle paul says this in romans 8 16 through 18 the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, the anointed. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We are not Christians, but are the anointed. Christianity is for the blind, and the anointed is for the seeing. Christianity is filled with all manner of Jew heresies. It is the synagogue of Satan. It is not the anointed but is the workers of iniquity. Judeo-Christianism has indoctrinated all white people with the idea that in order to be good, one must go to church. Of course, they then define the word to mean a building on some street where their religious denominationalism is espoused. Let's cut to the chase. Nothing in the scriptures defines church as a building at some address. Ask any Christian night, where do you go to church? And they'll give you the directions to a specific building's location. What they just told you is that I'm dumber than dirt and have no knowledge or understanding of the Bible. Our English word church comes from the Greek word kurikon, which is never used in the ancient Greek text from which the Bible is translated. The first time that the English word church appears in the King James Version of the New Testament is in Matthew 16, 18, where Jesus says to the disciples, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What is this thing that the gates of hell cannot prevail against? Does a building jump up off its foundations, run off and batter down gates? The Greek word mistranslated church. This verse is the word ekklesia. This is a compound of two words. The first part, ek, is a preposition meaning out of or from, and klesia is a noun meaning the called. Its literal meaning is those 
the called out of or from. So the word translated church is a who and not a what. The church is a living body according to Colossians 1.18 and not some man-made edifice existing on a plot of ground. This body is made up of the ones that God has called out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2.9 Jew perverted Christianism keeps you from knowing that there is a living, breathing flesh and blood people who are the ecclesia the called out ones of God who are to walk in his light. Light is the enemy of the Jew darkness which blinds our race to the fact that they have been led into a ditch by their clergy. Yes, these blinded ditch dwellers are called Christians, but they are not called the anointed and they go to church but it is not the living body of the called out ones As Jesus says they have built whited sepulchers which indeed appear beautiful outward but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanliness Matthew 23, 27. Every church is a mausoleum constructed to hold the victims of the successful campaign of the seed of the serpent chew. These walking dead called Christians are kept in these catacombs believing the church cock lies that after they die, then they will be saved and get to fly off to heaven because they're good church members and have said the magic words, I accept Jesus. These church cocked Christianites never give any thought as to why they are alive. They are so traumatized by the fear of death because they've been told about an everlasting hell that keeps them in chains of darkness as to the purpose of this earthly existence. In the whited sepulchers, they are bombarded with a lie that they are here just to get saved so they can escape the fiery hell, float off to heaven forever. Also, Paul speaks about these pathetic blinded dead in Romans 8, 15. They are held in the spirit of bondage again to fear. And then he says in Hebrews 2, 15, that Jesus came to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. These fearful captives cling to this distorted salvation because for a brief moment, heavenly visions dance in their stupefied heads. But here is the shocker. Nowhere in the scripture is salvation equated with going to heaven. Judeo-Christianism has corrupted the word salvation into a pie-in-the-sky daydream for some future fly-away eternal heavenly existence. This heaven-bound illusion was an easy sell to comatose creatures who dream of one day the great beyond, getting all the material stuff that they desire and cannot seem to acquire in this life. With this mindset, 
Christianites have no problem with trying to get all they can now since heaven will be a place where they can get even more. All their work will be over. They can enjoy their monstrous mansions during an eternity of ease. This keeps brain dead Christianites from realizing what biblical salvation really is. No, it has nothing to do with going to heaven. In the King James Version of the Bible, there are two Hebrew words used in the Old Testament which are translated salvation. And both of these words are also translated deliverance and hell. At no time do the hundred plus verses which these words are used give any implied meaning of going to heaven. In every instance, salvation, deliverance, and help are used for the here and now on earth, not for some event that transports one from earth to heaven for a future existence. The church cock professors of the salvation fantasy are not deterred for one moment simply because there's no Old Testament foundation to support their salvation aberration. They brush aside the entirety of the Old Testament by saying, we're New Testament Christians. The New Testament is translated from manuscripts written in Greek. There's only one Greek word, soteria, translated salvation, and it is also translated deliver in Acts 7.25. All of the time, soteria is translated salvation in the New Testament. There's not one innuendo about this pertaining to heaven. The salvation of the old is the same salvation of the new. God did not change his plan. What he is doing is delivering us from that which is going on here and now in the earth. Salvation is just another good word gone bad that the serpent has twisted itself around, distorted it into an anti-biblical perverted misdirecting concept. Start reading the scriptures using the word deliverance instead of salvation. And Christianism's heavenly pipe dream will vanish like the dew in the noonday sun. We need deliverance every day. Not in some mythical materialistic mansion filled life of luxury while floating around in the sky. The most sinister aspect of all this is that our people will not live as God's laws command, but are waiting to die so they can get out of the hell that their disobedience created on earth and to hop aboard a flight to the Big Rock Candy Mountain. Don't be caught in this quicksand, for we are to pray daily to be delivered from evil. Matthew 6, 13 and Luke 11, 4. Salvation's becoming after death hope for event, but deliverance is during life's visible events. Spirit-powered people experience the delivering presence of the Father in their lives. The Bible is all about deliverance during the here and now. It's not about a salvation joy ride pie in the sky after death. This sinister word game is taking a heavy toll upon our people by rendering them powerless, fearful captives laid out in whited sepulchers 
full of ignorance, darkness, evil, and death. It is all a misdirection and a deception. It is aimed at the destruction of Adamic white Israel, Western people. Word perverting comes not only from what is said, but also from what is not said. Jumanized Christianism has hidden our name, the name of our God, the name of our brother Jesus. If the white race is to ever see anything, then they must know who they are, who their God is, and who their deliverer Jesus is. This will come only with learning their name. For with these come identity. And without this, we become a rudderless ship tossed about with every wave and blown around with every wind, just like G113 says. There is no hope of achieving the destination in such aimless wondering. We do have a God. But Christianity, which supposedly has its root in the Bible, does not have a clue as to who this book says God is. Go into any church and ask the people a simple question. Who is your God? And after giving you a strange look, they'll respond, God! Now ask them, what is the name of your God? They'll again say, God, as if you did not understand it the first time. These people, ignorant of the Bible, worship a generic, no-name God. What Jesus told the woman at the well in John 4.22 applies to all Christianity. Ye worship, ye know not what. All other religions know the name of their God. But the dwellers in the tombs of Christianism know not whom they worship other than some no-name thing called God. But there are many gods, as the Bible points out in 1 Corinthians 8, 5 and 2 Corinthians 4, 4. So what is the name of the God of the Bible? It is first given in Genesis 2, 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. But where is the name in this verse? Remember that the scripture quoted is in English. It is a translation from another language. Looking at the ancient Hebrew reveals the true name of God, and it is not a generic term, the Lord God, but is Yahweh, the Lord, Elohim, God. Hundreds and hundreds of times, Yahweh Elohim is mistranslated in the King James Version, the Lord God. What kind of results would you have if you sent a letter addressed man, or if you wanted the operator to give you the phone number of man? Generic will never work. The name Yahweh Elohim is a very specific just like any person's name. For example, the name Dewey Tucker not only reveals the family Tucker, but also the individual in that family, Dewey. So we know that Elohim is the family. The Yahweh is the individual in that family. Yes, the God Yahweh in the Bible is a member of the Elohim family. People who do not know who their God is do not know who they are. 
and have no origin or identity. A map is no good unless you know the point of origin. No course can be plotted and no destination can be achieved. Such is Christianity today. Throughout the New Testament, the name of God is referenced. Jesus told the people, I am come in my Father's name, John 5, 43. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, John 10, 25. And Father glorify thy name. John 12, 28. In Jesus' prayer in John 17, he says in verse 6, I have manifested thy name. Then in verse 11, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. Then in verse 12, I kept them in thy name. And then in verse 26, And I have declared unto them thy name. The people in Jesus' day knew the name of their God from what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, which is recorded in the New Testament, in Matthew 21, 9, Mark 11, 10, Luke 19.38 and John 12.13 Like them, we too are to know and use the name of our God, Yahweh. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew 6.9 After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The very first thing we pray for is that our Father's name, Yahweh, be hallowed. The awesome power of the name Yahweh is demonstrated when the shepherd David went out to meet the giant Goliath in battle. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord Yahweh of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied this day. Will the Lord Yahweh deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee? And take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beast of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord Yahweh saveth delivers, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, Yahweh's, and he will give you into our hands, 1 Samuel 17, 45 through 47. It's no wonder King David said in Psalms 25, we will rejoice in thy salvation, deliverance, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord Yahweh fulfill all thy petitions. David's key is given us in Psalms 124, 8. Our help is in the name of the Lord Yahweh who made heaven and earth. It is only through using the name of our God, Yahweh, that we have power. And we must start using it. Yahweh is my God. Yahweh is my Father. Yahweh is the creator of all things. Yahweh is in control of everything in heaven 
and in earth, knowing that Yahweh is the only true God and that he has a name, is the beginning of the journey from darkness into light. John 1, 4, speaking about Jesus, says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The verse prior to this one says, He is the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, John says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Now look at Matthew one twenty one. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. This is also in the first chapter of Luke, verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. And bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. In both of these first chapters, it is written that the child is to be given a specific name, Jesus. To understand the meaning of this name, it will be necessary to know some biblical history. The New Testament, where these verses appear, was written in Greek. But the people of Jesus' day spoke Aramaic. The written Greek word, Iesus, is transliterated into the English word Jesus. It is a combination of two words, weos, meaning son, and Zeus, which is the name for the supreme Greek god and was written as such in the Hellenistic phase of Greek, also known as Koine or Biblical Greek. Many PhDs, theologians, clergy, and Jews have tried to confuse the issue by saying that Zeus was spelled Dios, but this was only in the more modern Greek. The Greek Most High God was a deity, Dios, but his name was Zeus. The world in Jesus' day understood the implied meaning of the Greek, Iesus, as the son of the highest God. So the transliteration was accepted, as shocking as it may be, Jesus' name is not the Son of God, and especially not the Son of Zeus. The truth about Jesus' name is revealed in Stephen's testimony, recorded in Acts the 7th chapter, verses 1 through 60. It is in verse 44 where he speaks about the tabernacle of witness which Moses made according to the fashion that he had seen. Now in verse 45 he says, which also, the tabernacle, our fathers that came after Moses' death brought in with Jesus, Jesus, into the possession of the nations. The most important part of this verse is that the tabernacle was brought in with Jesus. Stephen did not make this statement in Greek, but he spoke in Aramaic, which is derived from the spoken Hebrew of the Old Testament. Even though the Greek Jesus was written, it is not the name spoken by Stephen in Aramaic. Many modern translations even use the English word Joshua in this passage of scripture instead of the word Jesus. But they have no right to turn the Greek word Iesus into the English word Joshua. 
at least the King James translators were consistent because the Greek word Jesus is always transliterated into the English word Jesus. We know the name of the God of the Bible is Yahweh, and it is written as such in the Paleo-Hebrew script used down through the first century A.D. So if the New Testament had been written in the same language as the Old Testament, then we would have known the real name for Jesus, and it would not be the Greek transliteration, Iesus, it would be Yahweh and it is written as such in the Paleo-Hebrew script. Notice the root of God's name, Yahweh, is the same for Yahweh Shua. Christ said in John 14, 13, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Now, how important is the name? The Apostle Peter said in Acts 4, 12, Neither is there salvation, deliverance, in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, delivered. The name of Jesus, Jesus, is Yahweh Shua. And we must start using this name. Our God is Yahweh, and his anointed first begotten son is Yahweh Shua. With this knowledge, we can now learn our true identity. In Romans 125, the Apostle Paul says that evil people change the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. This is only one of the attributes of Yahweh God. And in Matthew 6, 9, Jesus, Yahweh Shua, says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven. And this is another attribute of Yahweh God. Understand the meaning of these two statements. Yahweh is the creator and the Father, and these are not synonymous or equal terms. Person can invent or create things and can also have children, but one does not have anything to do with the other. Something so obvious escapes rational thought when it comes to the scriptures. In reality, there are only two things which exist, and they are Yahweh God's creation and his family. In Genesis 12, 3, Yahweh tells Abram, And I will bless them that bless thee, Abram, and curse him that curseth thee, Abram, and in thee, Abram, shall all families of the earth be blessed. This verse is so simple and yet so profound. There are two completely different entities being addressed here. Abram and all families of the earth. This is seen again in Genesis 28:14, And thy, Abram's, Seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou, Abram, shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, Abram, and in thy, Abram's, seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Don't miss what is and is not said. God did not say all the other families of the earth, but did say 
Abram's seed would become an innumerable multitude like the dust of the earth would spread abroad in every direction and would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Evidently, there are all the families of the earth and Abram's seed, his descendants, his race, which by necessity are not of the earth, or else they too would be included in the group all the families of the earth. It also must be noted that Abram's lineage, according to Genesis, goes all the way back to Adam, who was the first son of God. Luke 3, 38. The first time that Adam is mentioned is in Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This verse is quoted from the King James Version of the Bible, which is an English translation from the ancient manuscripts that were written in Paleo-Hebrew. This verse, the word translated the Lord, is the Paleo-Hebrew word transliterated Yahweh and is the name of the only true God. The word translated formed is the Paleo-Hebrew word transliterated Weyeser and means to fashion something. This is not creating something from nothing, but is forming, fashioning something that already exists. The words translated man are the Paleo-Hebrew words transliterated etha adam. Etha is the equivalent of our English definite article the and adam, which means to show blood in the face, to be rosy, to be able to blush. This was such a unique characteristic that this first son of God was named for it, and so he was called the Adam. The verse correctly read says, In Yahweh God fashioned the Adam of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The Adam became a living soul. Yes, Adam was formed, fashioned into a flesh and blood body and was then able to inhabit the earth. Now the next verses say, In Yahweh God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the Adam whom he had fashioned. Notice if God put Adam into the garden eastward in Eden, then it would have had to have been on earth before Adam. Verse 15 tells what Yahweh's purpose for Adam was. Verses 16 and 17 speak about the trees in the garden, which were not ordinary garden variety trees, for one was even called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. According to Ezekiel 31, 3 through 9, the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God were family trees of races and nations. The family trees of Eden became all the families of the earth, which were here millennia before the Adam. The descendants of Adam through Abraham to Israel, and down to Jesus, Yahweshua, were not of these earthly created races, but were the family of Yahweh placed into the earth. It is this lineage 
that carries the unique racial characteristic which gave the first son of God his name, the Adam. This race today is still the one that is able to show blood in the face is rosy and is able to blush. No other race can do this except the white race. No, the Jews can't blush. They're not white. Neither are they the Israel of the Bible. The Bible is a book about the Adamic race stated in Genesis 5.1. It is only this Adamic white Israel western race that is Yahweh's family in the earth and everything else in heaven and earth is his creation. From Genesis 2.4 we know that the Lord God is Yahweh Elohim, and yes, Elohim is the family name of Yahweh, and his racial children have the same family name Elohim, according to the scriptures. John 10, 30, Jesus Yahweh Shua said, I and my Father are one claiming to follow the word of God, the law, the Jews immediately took up stones to kill Jesus, exposing their complete hypocrisy. Jesus points them into the very law they pretend to obey and corruptly claimed was theirs. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods, John 10, 34. This is a direct quotation from Psalms 82, 6. I have said, ye are gods. And it is the Hebrew word Elohim that is translated gods in this verse. The concept of gods is not confined to just the Old Testament, but flowed from the very lips of Jesus. Now the question arises, who are these gods? Jesus says in John 10.35 that they are the ones unto whom the word of God came. Now go back to Psalms 82.6. And look at the whole verse. I have said you are gods, Elohim. And all of you are the children of the Most High. These gods, Elohim, are the children of the Most High. The first time the Hebrew word Elohim is used in the Bible is in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Even the King James translators were correct. Genesis 1.26 with this God being a plurality. And God, Elohim said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. In other words, try to explain away the us and our. Corrupted Christianism developed a new theology of the Trinity, which term and concept is never found in the Bible either. No, the Elohim are not believers or acceptors of any ideology, but are what the scriptures define them as being. Jesus tells the Jews in John 10, 36, Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. Now go back to Psalms 82, 6, where it says, All of you are children of the Most High. Elohim are the children of the Most High, the sons of God, sent into the world, 
unto whom the word of God came. Who was the first Elohim that was sent into the world, being the Son of God? It was Adam of Genesis 2-7, the Adamic white Israel western race, the family of Yahweh, the children of the Most High, the sons of God, the Elohim, did exist in the heavens before the world was ever created. This fact is taught throughout the New Testament. Jesus told the disciples, Rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Luke 10, 20. It was in the heavens when our names were written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Revelation 17, 8. We, as the racial children of God, Elohim, pre-existed this world. And this is all according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4. All this is God's hidden wisdom and is a mystery to the world, as Paul says. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. Throughout this earthly journey, our Father keeps us in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Titus 1, 2. We did not come into existence by being born on earth in a flesh body any more than did Jesus. Read what he prays in John 17, 14, and 16. They are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. We're not of the world. But we were with our Father Yahweh before the world was. Be assured that it is God who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ the Anointed, Jesus before the world began, 2 Timothy 1 9. All things pertaining to us were given us before the world began. As in Genesis 1 26, the us and our in these verses are the Elohim. As we were with the Father in the heavens, he is with us in the earth. With this understanding, does Romans 8, 29 make more sense? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You, the Adamic white people, are the Elohim that God did foreknow the heavens. You, the Adamic white people, are the Elohim that God did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, your older brother, Yahweshua. It is the Elohim that are the heavenly family of Yahweh that put on Adamic white flesh and blood bodies and came into earth. At this point, 
in the timetable of Yahweh's plan, it is imperative that the good words that have gone bad are no longer used by those who have been given light. The God of the Bible has a name, and it is not the Lord or the generic term God, but is Yahweh, the individual that lived 2,000 years ago that is the prophesied Messiah of the Bible has a name and it is not the transliteration of the ancient Greek word Iesus, which means Son of God, but is Yahweh Shawah, whose root is Yahweh. Christ is not Jesus, Yahweh Shawah's last name, and Christian has nothing to do with a religion, but they are the transliterations of the ancient Greek words, which needs to be translated according to their exact meaning, anointed. Yahweh is the only true God, and Yahweh Shua is the anointed of Yahweh. You, the Adamic white Israel Western people, are the family Elohim of Yahweh and the brother of Yahweh Shua, and the Elohim in flesh bodies are also anointed of Yahweh. According to Genesis 5.1, the Bible is the book pertaining to this genia not generation, but genetic, divine, race, Elohim. It is while in earth that the race Elohim are not saved to go back to heaven from which they came, but are delivered from the evil while they are here. Church is not a building made by men but is the body of Yahweh Shua that is being built by Yahweh, it is made up of the Elohim that will be administers of the kingdom of Yahweh in earth. The seed of the serpent Jew will never be able to corrupt the true vocabulary of the Bible. These are the words that will live forever. They are Yahweh. Yahweh Shua, Elohim, divine race, Adamic white Israel, the anointing, delivered, body of Yahweh Shua. And these words are the power turns darkness into light that delivers from captivity into freedom and that changes adolescence into the perfected sons of Yahweh. This message is produced by truthfromgod.com, which is one of hundreds of messages that can be read, heard, and watched at truthfromgod.com.